two-thirds of students regularly cannot afford the basics. We can afford a universal student allowance if we tax the rich. Because right now, we have a situation in this country where we know full well that the wealthiest 311 families hold $85 billion worth of wealth. That is 2.4% of all of the wealth in this country. That is more than the 2% of wealth at the bottom. Two and a half million New Zealanders combined hold. That is not an accident. It is a consequence of a tax system that overtaxes worth and undertaxes. It actually doesn't tax at all the state of wealth in this country. And it means that the average New Zealander pays effectively double the tax rate of the effective tax rate of the wealthiest in this country. This stuff is not an accident. It is a consequence of political decisions that have decided to prioritize particularly the voices of 120,000 landlords over 400,000 students. So realize your power this election because you can change it all. <laughs> For the members of the opposition is what are they so scared of? I would implore members of the opposition to point us to which of the tax principles they are opposed to. Because in lieu of being able to do that, we can ascertain that they believe that these principles are important. Which then leaves us with the question of why they are opposed to seeing those tax principles reported against and that information inserted into the public sphere. I just have to reflect on one of the sentiments that's never left my mind since it came out of the mouth of Andrew Bailey in a tax debate that we were having a few years ago when he said, and I quote, that there is such a thing as legitimate tax avoidance, end quote. Well, Madam Speaker, that's, that's the quiet part said out loud. out loud. We have a tax system that enables the wealthiest in this country to continue to arrange their affairs, their assets and their wealth in such a way that sees them, as reflected in the High Wealth Individuals report, paying an effective tax rate less than half of that of the average New Zealander. And I just think it's important to put on the record what is uh, on the table here. Because a retired couple under the National Party's plan would receive an extra $13 per week from the Nats, but $13 $32 per week from the Greens. A family with two kids at primary school with a combined income of $130,000 would receive $50 per week under the National Party, but $188 per week under the Greens. They've also promised to double the price of public transport for people with low incomes and disabilities. They've also promised kind of a bit of a climate dividend, but if you read between the lines and get into the detail of their policy document, what you find is that instead they're looking to raid the ETS revenue raised in to the um, Climate Emergency Response Fund to pay for their tax cuts, which disproportionately benefit those at the top end of town. And that's not even getting into the heroic assumptions around foreign buyers. Mr Speaker, they have the gall to tell us that they care about house prices, but they can't even say they want them to come down. New Zealand can choose transformation this election, Mr Speaker, and it looks like a party vote green. In 2023, confronted with the dual crises of inequality and climate change, we have the opportunity to completely transform our economy to meet those challenges and ensure that all of us have what we need, not only to survive, but to thrive. In this election, only the Green Party are laying out that evidence-based plan to achieve that. What we're seeing, particularly from the two legacy parties, are propositions for tinkering. And I think that that is precisely the kind of nonsense which has been exhausting New Zealanders up and down the country that I've been speaking to over the past few months. A different world is possible. All it requires is the political willpower to get us there.